Good morning, friends. Nice to be here. Nice to be home. I was en vadrouille, as you say in French, on the road here and there for the last 10 days or so. I was uh, teaching in London with many of you. I also had a few days of retreat time, which was nice. I went down to Gaia House in Devon and sat there in the rain for five days and uh, had some just some quiet time, some sitting time and some writing time, actually. So um, gave me a little bit. I'm writing a, a book at the moment and it was great to have a few days of space for that. So after all of that, oh, it's nice to just come home to spring. I came home in the sunshine and woke up this morning in the rain. And uh, we're just getting things kind of organized after a winter of a lot of building work and renovations, a lot of digging up the earth to bury pipes and things and making a huge mess. And now we have the first retreat of the year next week. And so we just kind of like everything is getting back into looking beautiful and neat and uh, ready to welcome people to come on retreat. All right. Here we are. Time to meditate together. And this theme we have this week called Human Nature, Buddha Nature. Yesterday, we just we opened that up a little bit. And um, I thought today to speak about one of these. It's actually something I was teaching about um, in London on Monday, uh, on Saturday, <clears throat> which is to do with these two different ways to think of mind. And human nature tends to follow one way of thinking about mind. And Buddha nature is grounded in the other way. And one way we can think of those is in terms of mind objects and mind essence. Mind objects and mind essence. So mostly, m most of us know all the time is mind objects. Even when we think about my mind, right? What, what's, so we, we can recognize, oh, objects are that which appear in mind. Okay. So, you know, whatever appears, that's a mind object, right? Here's the bell striker. Oh, yeah. So material object. And then there are also immaterial objects. So the you know, thoughts, feelings, memories, reactions, they're all things that happen in the mind. Right. So also body, just the, 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 the felt sense of body sensations. Right? You talk about body and mind. But we can equally recognize that in our experience, body is a mind object, right? The experience, like the, the temperature I can feel in my hand now, right? and the way I can look out and see your hand. So, of course, a hand's an object. It's a material, rupa datu, a material element. That's the Pali. But it's experienced as an object in experience in mind. And then arupadatu, immaterial objects, or memory, right? not, not seeing, not touching anything, but it's appearing in the mind immaterially, or a f feeling of sadness. Oh. So all of that right, are mind objects, material and immaterial. And even, as I say, when we think of my mind, we think of my mind as the place where those mind objects appear. So let's just, just for a moment, what do you mean when you say my mind? What is it, my mind? I, I wonder. <laughs> I've been I've been doing this for so long that I really have nothing. I I don't I have no response when I think of my mind. It just feels like what's my mind? It just feels like profoundly mysterious, wide open, completely undefinable. So, but what about for you? Just if you're honest, well, what do you, what, what do you, how would you describe or define or point to your mind? What's my mind? 
Right? Because mostly, if we do try to point to anything or identify anything, we think, oh, that's it, that's my mind. Even though we think that's my mind, it's mostly a mind object. Right? It's the thought of my mind. A thought is a mind object. It's the sense of, oh, my mind is this sort of sense of me that I have in my head. That's a mind object. So if everything we can see, touch, feel, grasp, etc., is a material mind object, rupa datu, and everything that we think, remember, feel, imagine, conceive of is an immaterial mind object, including ideas of my mind, then what is mind essence? If everything the mind can know is a mind object, what is mind essence? So we could say, oh, well, mind essence is the knowing itself. The, the 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 fundamental luminosity of being in this human experience. All the experiences themselves are mind objects. The, the 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 screen. It's not really a good image, but we could say the screen on which all those experiences are projected. The space in which all these experiences, mind objects, appear and disappear. This is mind essence. So our attention is constantly pulled into the realms of mind objects. And our practice is one of firstly being, recognizing mind essence, fundamental knowing, basic luminosity, oh. and then whew, relaxing into mind essence, abiding as mind essence, where we can be both intimate with mind objects, all their comings and goings, and yet also whew, free around mind objects intimate with, yet independent from. And that sounds like a, a contradiction. Intimate with, yet independent from. Inside, inside the breath, with our awareness, inside the sensations, inside all the appearing of mind objects, and simultaneously spacious around. For that space that is both within the appearances of things and which is also all around the appearance of things. And so if the Buddha talks about mind objects as rupa dhatu and arupa, like formless obj uh, material objects and immaterial objects, mind essence he speaks about as niroda dhatu or nibbana dhatu. Niroda means cessation like stopping it's like mind essence as that vast empty space into which all objects dissolve it's kind of like i was talking about this on saturday in london it's sort of like a black hole of consciousness which might not sound very inspiring but it has that sense of just being like vast mysterious and exerting this kind of Influence where everything can just dissolve, everything can just drop, everything can just be swallowed up by this sort of infinite peace, actually. And that's the other term, Nibbana Datu. It means like that element of like of ultimate peace. And so um, in contrast to the mind objects, which are always busy, always coming and going, always active, always pulling at the attention. Mind essence has these qualities of, of non-objectness, no thingness, emptiness, goneness, vastness, openness, spaciousness, peacefulness, and yet also ungraspableness, undefinableness, unfindableness. So the problem is we're so used to mind objects. Then if we talk about mind essence, we start looking for it. Oh, where's my mind? But all you'll find is mind objects. Mind essence is unfindable. And yet it's that in which the finding is happening. That in which the looking is happening. Right? Like that other example I sometimes give is like looking for your eyes. Where are my eyes? Can't you can never see your eyes. You can never ever see your eyes. You look in the mirror, but you're not seeing your eyes. You're seeing a reflection 
of eyes. All the eyes can see is visual objects. Right? So does that mean that my eyes don't exist because they can't be seen? No, it means that if we just attend to the seeing, the seeing itself is the confirmation of eyes. And the knowing itself, the, the, the being here itself, the fundamental luminosity of mind is the confirmation of mind essence, this vast background, which actually invites us to rest and in which all objects kind of find their naturalness of coming and going. So maybe that speaks to you in a way that reflects your own mind, reflects your own understanding. Maybe that kind of opens up a direction of looking for you. Maybe it sounds just a little strange and unclear and confusing, in which case feel free to let it rest. And let's see if we can both let that inform our meditation, but also put it down. There's nothing to figure out here. Let's just give skillful and wise attention to the mind objects as they come and go. Let's see if in doing that we might fur, infer and orientate to and rest ourselves into a mind essence, which makes all experience possible. So please take your seat for meditation. Settling into your posture. Letting your attention gently gather and settle. As if your attention is somehow filling up your body filling up this whole field of experience. Entering into and blending with the mind objects of sensation and sound, breath and body, comings and goings. as if your attention is soaking into the feel of sitting here, like gentle rain soaking into the earth. Your body field becoming drenched with awareness.
awareness. The natural knowing of your consciousness. Awareness illuminating bodily sensations. Awareness revealing each breath. Awareness as the heart and the ground of each moment, each experience. Rest your attention in awareness. Relaxing into the comings and goings of mind objects. Letting breath be natural. Letting sensations happen. Letting sound come and go. Nothing to manage. Nothing to reach for. Nothing to resist, nothing to retain. Hmm. Entering into awareness means entering into ease with the comings and goings of everything. Ease and spaciousness.
rest into awareness. And we allow things to be as they are. And we enter into the comings and goings. Naturalness of breathing and sound and sensation and thought. The arisings and passings of all mind objects. And we relax into that natural fleeting fluidity of everything. We start to get some, some sense, an indefinable sense of the open space in which they all come and go. A space that's ungraspable, unfindable, unidentifiable, and yet which is the space of all happenings, of all comings and goings, of all experience. Open space. Deep space. Space that's within everything and around everything. Within body and around body. Within the breath and around the breath. Within each thought and all around each thought. open space. Luminous space.
when we rest into awareness, we release our grip on mind objects. We relax our restlessness and give up our fascination with where our attention keeps going off to. We taste the Nibbana Dattu, that is peace. Letting mind objects unfold freely. Letting awareness abide freely, spaciously, openly.
I'm sitting here at the interface of human experience, the union of mind objects and mind essence. Releasing mind objects, giving them their freeness to come and go. And any idea we might have of mind essence, any image, any concept, any mind state, releasing that too, it's just a mind object. Oh, you'll find our true home. Mm. Ungraspable mind essence. Let me be free of grasping after concepts and ideas, states and experiences. May we be intimate with, yet independent from, all the comings and goings. We know our true refuge and freeness of being as the Nibbana Datu. Free from the beginning.
Mm. All right. Oh, I would have liked to just sit there for a while longer. Something about the very gentle sound of the rain outside. Rain on the roof always reminds me of my very first med meditation retreat. The first retreat I ever did was three months in a monastery in Thailand. It was just during that time of year when it's hot, but also very humid. And just the sound, there's something about the sound of raindrops and dripping roof and wet leaves that sort of transports me back to the potency and import, how important, beautiful that time was, even though it was terribly hard and painful for me, uh, wrestling with my mind during those first months of practice. Oh dear. Anyway. Right. There's some time for questions. Just, I wanted to just say hello to Vulkan. Hey, Wolfgang, nice to see and hear from you. And I see, I remember that you're in Creta, in Crete. And I wonder if you know my old friend Paco, who's actually here at the moment at the Mulan on personal retreat. But he lives in Creta, generally, in Matala. And he gives concerts every week, sort of psychedelic uh, sitar concerts, using the name Sitar Sonic. So check him out through the summer sometime if you're in Crete. And you can... Also then connect with each other as fellow yogis and practitioners. You may know each other from back in the day in Bodhgaya as well. He was there. Um, yeah, he was there in the 90, late, sort of late 90s. You know, I think we were there, well, all through the 90s. I remember you were there already early 90s, no? Yeah. All right. Nice. Um, I see there's a question from Fiona, which I'll get to in a minute. But just let me shoehorn in a mention of dana you know because <laughs> i mention it every day that i teach it's easy to sort of switch off on this but you know just for the one minute reminder that i give you about dana you know that's that's the price <laughs> that's the price that's the only price of admission here right of, of um you know because it's freely freely available it's free of any kind of responsibility or, or obligation for all of you, it's free of any kind of uh, charge, you know, but of course it's not free of costs. There's a lot of costs and there's only one way that all of the many thousands of euros of overheads each month, there's only one way those costs are met. And that's by many small donations, you know? some larger donations as well. You know, so, uh, some larger offerings, but we don't have some kind of, you know, um, billionaire uh, benefactor who who props up or fills up any shortfall. No, all of the all of the dark, no, and all of the costs are met basically by, you know, your offerings. So if I mention it every day, you know, it's just because that mention is what allows that mention and the reminder of dana is what allows you to be reminded to offer dana what allows sangha life to receive dana and therefore what allows all of this to happen you know it is it would it would completely break down very quickly if the dana support wasn't there and of course sometimes that dana support is precarious in various ways but it's operating on this principle of you know, good heart and mutual participation and supporting each other so just to thank you in advance for the dana that you offer and the way it supports me as the teacher this week supports sangha live in existing and flourishing and continuing and it therefore supports everybody else who is able to and um, then come and practice and receive teachings etc so beautiful beautiful good in the beginning good in the middle good in the end thank you and George, there it is, right on cue. There's the, the link uh, for offering Dana. All right, let me go back up to the um, Fiona's question. I have a lot of anxiety around money. I'm self-employed. And, um, and business is uh, triggering disproportionate levels of fear and panic. I think it's complex. First, aha, uh -huh, from childhood when my dad lost his job and he couldn't cope and used alcohol. Right. So, of course, there's the, there's the real concern, right? Current reality. What's very helpful in these kind of things is separating out current reality 
from past imprint. Let me read the rest of the question first. Family never recovered. Yeah, yeah. It's my terror that's the major difficulty, exactly. But when the terror is triggered, it's all consuming. So, present reality. What's present reality? Hmm. Okay. Presumably, I mean, it sounds like that from what you're, you're, um, from what you're saying. Present reality is okay. Oh, downturn in your business, etc. You might need you need to take care. You need to adjust, etc. So, present reality. Oh, I've got a roof over my head, and as well as the present reality of external circumstances, the present reality is you've got resources, right? You've got the resource of your practice. You've got the resource of some discernment. You've got the resource of the wisdom and clarity enough to recognize, oh, I'm being triggered by some past situation and difficulty. Right? So that's the first thing is orientating yourself to what's actually the present reality. And then at the same time, also recognizing, okay, what's the past imprint, right? Oh, there's fear inherited from the chaos of childhood, the instability when my father lost his job, the dysregulation and difficulty that arose out of his subsequent alcohol abuse, the impact that ha that had on me as a child, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And oh, and so you have to. Both of those things are happening, right? There's the present reality, oh. and then there's the, the imprint from the past and the 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 processing of that is being able to ground in present reality point to present reality feel the truth of present reality recognize the support and okayness that's here in present reality and using that the steadiness of that to then okay open to the the past imprint and the ways in which it's not yet metabolized resolved you know etc if you don't ground well in the present reality, you'll just get pulled into the vortex of the past imprint, right? And then, like you say, the terror, the drama, and then you can, you, that becomes all consuming and you can't see present reality anymore. And therefore you're just pulled into and pushed around by the, the, the conditioning of the past. And so if you feel that's what you're doing, you've got and you're starting to go too far or you have gone too far, you need to stop attending to that and really attend to present reality, really attend what's good, what's stable, what's reassuring, oh, what's nourishing in present reality and be well established in that in order to attend to past stuff. So that's most of it. I just want, would want to add one caveat, uh, Fiona. And you can see if it's helpful or not. It may may not. So you can feel free to reject it if it's not helpful. But that is to think that if you know that you've got this very strong conditioning from the past, and if it's not at all easy to do what I just said in terms of that sort of present past stuff, then you might, you know, sort of work direct more directly with somebody else on that. But if it's, it's if it's very intense and very ongoing, you might reflect on whether being self-employed, which is precarious by its nature, is the best fit for you. Right? And whether um, a, a kind of more uh, a salaried job working for somebody else uh, might, like I say, feel free to reject that. I don't know your circumstance. It may be that no way, you're no way are you interested in a salaried job and being self-employed is the best fit for you. So I'll leave that with you. And, you know, not knowing more of the situation, that's as much as I can probably say helpfully. All right. Oh, there's somebody saying we met Paco last summer in Crete. That's nice. Nice. Uh, Eva, I wonder if you can recommend a meditation retreat or place in Thailand. If you look at my website, uh, Eve, martinaylwood.com, there's a tab somewhere in my website to links to places of practice. And there's a link to several places in Thailand. I haven't spent much time in Thailand recently and I'm not, I don't really know the scene there. So I'm maybe not the best placed person for those kind of recommendations anymore. But I have put links to several places that I have known in the past or that other good friends have been to recently, etc. 
So I don't know what that tab is called. It might be called Sangha, or it might be called Links, or it might be called Friends, or something like that. But somewhere in my website, you'll find a link to places of practice. And there's a section for Asia, a section for Europe, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. All right. Sonia says, I have dreams and nightmares. Are they mind objects too? Yeah, sure. Even though I am not conscious as I am sleeping, or is it soul spaciousness working out the psyche of the day? Well, it might be soul, soul spaciousness. I like, I like your description. But even if it is that, they're still mind objects. Everything, everything is a mind object, right? But the mind objects of dream life are different than the mind objects of waking life, right? Still mind, but mind work with a different, um, it's like a different spectrum of mind, you know? So just like if we close our eyes and imagine something, that's still a mind object. It's not a material mind object. It's an immaterial, right? It's that which is imagined. So something that's imagined, we say, isn't real. It is real. It's just real in a different dimension, right? It's, a, it's something we can touch is one kind of real. Something that's imagined is another kind of real. Or to quote Leonard Cohen, it's real, but it ain't exactly there. Or it's there, but it ain't exactly real. <laughs> and I would say that that applies to all mind objects. They, they're, they're here, but they ain't exactly real. Or they're real, but they ain't exactly here. Brilliant, brilliant poetic description of, of uh, all mind objects. So, and at the same time, definitely, some, some, sometimes what is happening in the dream life is the bringing up of emotional material that we're either not attending to or not able to attend to in waking life. So I'll leave aside the kind of analysis of dreams because that's not really my field. Sometimes we, we have a clear sense of what a dream is about. Great. If not, you know, we might be drawn to try and analyze it, etc., or not. But I would say, what's the feeling that you wake up with from the the nightmare when you wake up what are you feeling you're feeling fearful or panicked dysregulated uh uh hurt emotionally you know sad or hurt I, I don't know it depends what the nightmare is make you can't do much about the dream right because you're unconscious in the dream but when you wake up you can do a lot about caring for the state in which you wake up like what's how do I really take care of this? Be spacious with this. Recognize this as a mind object. Give it space, give it care, give it attention, but also an attention that's kind of like non-identified. It's like, oh, it's just this burning off. Of course, that's hard to do when one's activated by fear or hurt or drama of some kind. But that's your practice, right? Giving it care and space care and space the care is a kind of coming in letting yourself feel it being very gentle with it and the space is a <sighs> remaining sort of open so there's really room for it all right good uh, lean asks what you wonder what you said about being the space in which the objects appear and at the same time being intimate with the objects yeah and I recently experienced more distance. I've often been laughing out loud because I see a thought passing by presenting itself as something real, which is not really anything at all. Just exactly. Just like Leonard Cohen was saying, very funny. Or I see the body doing things by itself, just happening by itself. When or why is it necessary to be intimate with objects? So sometimes, Lean, we can feel that presence or awareness as being more intimate more inside i feel like oh yeah my awareness is in the breath awareness in the body awareness in the experience and sometimes we feel the awareness is more kind of outside and just oh, just seeing happening just seeing happening both are fine the and both have a, a limitation if we go too far one or the other right so ideally, one has some sense of both. The limitation of going to just being intimate with is you tend to get identified with if there isn't that sort of wider field of spaciousness. The limitation of the wider field of spaciousness is a sort of 
that it can be a little disengaged or um, not, not quite disassociated, but that sort of thing, a bit like, oh, distant from and a bit not engaged with it. So you have to just check and see for yourself. If there's a sense, it sounds like it's still feeling quite alive. That's the important thing. Like you say, oh, it's funny. You're just watching it happen by itself, right? So within your day, as that's going on, oh, just thoughts, just body. Yeah, wonderful. Let it all happen. Enjoy the spaciousness, right? Within your formal practice of meditation, though, I would say give some attention to that more, that first form of more uh, intimate awareness going in inhabiting right what you'll find is ironically paradoxically they're the same the space of being intimate of being aware inside experience and the space of being aware all around experience is actually the same even though it sounds opposite but it's good if you're used to that more spacious way it's good to give some attention first in meditation i would say first 10 minutes or so going in going in and then so that you're in enough to then find that you're also around, if that makes sense. So that it, you, even though there's that sense of openness and spaciousness, you're still looking for a sense of being embodied, present, here in what's happening. Oh, yeah, here in what's happening and here around what's happening. All right. Um, I see there are more questions, but I think we'll have to stop here. Natalie, maybe uh, are these all mind objects. All right, we'll just do this quickly and then we'll end. Looking at the hand, mind object. Seeing it as my hand, mind object. Closing the eyes and feeling the hand, but seeing a visual image. Yes, mind object. Closing the eyes, placing attention in the sensation of the hand, just sensation. Yes, all mind objects. Everything, every aspect of experience is a mind object. The only thing is the, the, the very fact that all these mind objects are appearing and they're, and they're not appearing. But everything you can point to, identify, think about, conceive of, remember, imagine, grasp, think, any mind objects, mind objects, mind objects. Everything is mind objects. What is mind essence? Everything is a mind object what is no thingness emptiness sunyata anatta substancelessness but it's that which cannot be objectified cannot be grasped cannot be conceived of cannot be imagined cannot be thought of and yet that which is animating every moment it's animating all the processes you just described right so the hand is the object is a mind object the thought of the hand is a mind object the feel of the hand is a mind object where are all those mind objects happening? In the luminosity of mind essence. All right. Thank you, friends. Wolfgang, you'll you'll come across Paco. He's a big character. He'll be famous in Matala. Or just look for posters of or look up Sitar Sonic. All right. Um, I see there's plenty more. I'll I'll and there's other questions as well. Please feel free to um to if you didn't if you have a question that didn't get explored today or responded to please feel free to just copy it back in tomorrow george thank you for uh, pasting in the leonard cohen quote yeah it's coming from the feel that it ain't exactly real or it's real but it ain't exactly there oh, exquisite all right friends is sending you meta Appreciating your presence and your practice here. And uh, look forward to it tomorrow. May you go through the day in an ease of comings and goings, letting mind objects form and unform freely. And maybe within that, the whisper, the, the, the brilliance of mind essence can shine through. Thank you. <laughs>